So, today I'll be showing you the Protoflux tool, which is the tool that we use to write our code in here. And also, kind of my namesake here. <laughs> so, let's just go right over here where I set up some examples. First, we'll have an empty object with an omelet material, and we have a sphere that is just a regular sphere that you can grab and move around. Now, the first thing we need to actually do is we need to get the tool. The tool can be found if you go to your inventory, under inventory, resonite essentials, tools. And here, the second tool is the protoflux tool, and we can double tap that, and it'll spawn out. Now, if we grab it and open our context menu, we can then equip it, or if it's out like this and we use our laser, we can highlight it, click it, and then equip it like that. Now, the first thing that's important about it is the way you get nodes. If you open your context menu with the tool equipped, here you'll have the node browser, where you can browse the nodes. Now, as an example, we can go, for example, to operators, go to is null, for example, and get an is null URL. Don't have to know what it does currently, just it's a node. Now then we can simply grab these points with trigger, not with actual grab. You grab this, these points to make a little wire, and then if you press secondary, you'll generate either an input or a display of the correct type. So as an example here, these or URI fields here are essentially for links and resource pointers, so if we just call this, for example, HTTPS resonite.com, you'll actually see that this turns into a valid URI, and this is null node here, just checks whether this input here is null or not, and as you can see, since it's not null, it'll display false. Now, if we want to rip this apart, we can just grab one of the nodes, open our context menu, and like any other object, hit destroy. Or, if you just want to unplug the nodes, you simply put your tool near it, hold down trigger, and if you drag, you'll see this little wire from where your, your tool used to be. Now, what you do is you simply make the tool intersect with a wire, and you'll see the wire highlight red, and then you'll let go, and it'll cut the wire. Now, another thing that is useful here is if we have something, like for example, a value write, which is something that write val writes values, you'll sometimes see stuff like this here, where you have all of these lines with like the asterisk, on written, value, on fail, and at the very top you have write. Now, if that's a bit too noisy for you, you can open your context menu with the tool equipped and click toggle overview mode. If you do this, it'll get rid of all of the lines in between and just make the text itself bigger. This way, if you don't like the look with the lines, you can easily get rid of it. However, as you just noticed, if I hover over it, it'll quickly tell me exactly what these things are. And also, if I hover over these note points here on the sides, it'll tell me exactly what these note points are. For example, this is on fail, this is on written, this is value write, I seek operation, which is asterisk, and this is simply the value. Now, what it'll also tell you is the data type of the field. For example, here um, of the point. For example, here the unwritten is a continuation. Now, a continuation is an interesting type that will take on either a synchronous or asynchronous state versus, for example, a isync operation, which will be generally synchronous unless triggered by an asynchronous operation. So if we did this here, we currently get nothing because we're not actually writing to anywhere. However, if we pull out the on fail, you'll see that now we're actually getting pulses through it. Now, 
asynchronous is pretty easy to make too if you go to flow async and then for example let's get out a start async task you'll have here the task start on started and on failed as well as an asterisk input for a synchronous operation now what this allows us to do is it allows us to actually begin an asynchronous task from an from a synchronous task because if you were to actually try to for example trigger an asynchronous task from a synchronous task such as this call here it would not work and if you for example had this continuation here plugged in everything would turn red because technically speaking a continuation is a valid input for this however since we started off synchronous here this continuation is also synchronous and you cannot continue into an asynchronous function from the synchronous node so if you want to do that you actually have to either start an async task and go into the right or you just flip it around where instead of directly starting the async task we first do our synchronous operation which then starts the async task which then triggers the asynchronous operation now i'm not going to go too deep into what async is and what sync is it was just important to know that this is how the nodes are supposed to be set up and how they cannot be set up now next over here we can easily make a driver for our color which just means that this will be actually controlling the field now so if we make this red we will have it red over here the way you do this is simply by grabbing the field pin color opening a context menu and clicking on to drive now if you want to use this color in your code you'll simply grab the pin color open your context menu and click source which will then get you a little reference to the value of this field and if we if we edit this so for example make it red again you'll see that it once more shows one zero 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 which is specifically a state one zero 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 that's here and it'll also tell you it's linear because every single color x has a profile attached to it which just tells the engine how to interpret that color now we can also generate something that's called a reference now for a field like tint color that's not really too useful usually because all it gives you is a sync color x and you can't really use these with regular color x's so instead what i'll be showing you is over here you can grab an entire component and while you cannot generate a drive or a source you can generate a reference now what this this helps you with is if we open the node browser and we go into interaction grabbable and then is grabbable grabbed and spawn this out and by the way the way you spawn these out is just by double tapping the trigger you can actually hook this up we'll generate a little cast here because it needs to convert the data type first from grabbable to i grabbable and we can spawn out this here so have a little display of what it's doing and then if we grab this it'll go to true now next when you're done with what you want to do like for example we set this up specifically to make it so that the mesh render is invisible by making it drive of the enabled state but only invisible when it's not being grabbed which is not really optimal let's invert that quickly which is under operators and then we go to boolean and we go to not and we just don't generate a bool we could use a not bool however we'll generate a not ulong4 now if you have an invalid data type you simply 
plug in the correct one. And it'll actually autocorrect the node. Now, as you can see, we now have the proper behavior of it disappearing visually because we're not actually disabling the sphere itself, just the mesh renderer. So it'll disappear when we're holding it. Now, since we're now done with our behavior, we select this by simply holding down the secondary, which will make this little circle appear. We can do it again in order to deselect it. And once it's selected, you can do a few things. You can move them around. You can move, delete them all together by clicking destroy, just like with a single one. Uh, you could clear, click clear selection in the context menu too, if you don't like just manually selecting them. However, uh, this will actually clear all selections rather than just clearing a specific selection. Now, once you have it selected, and you go to your little object here, we can make a new slot here and call this code, for example. And let's call this code hide on grab so that anyone who looks at our code in the future knows that this is specifically the hide on grab function. Then we simply grab this code in a hide on grab slot, open our context menu, and then we can here pack it into the slot. And if we click onto this little triangle here, you'll see that it's now actually painted underneath here. And if we grab it again, we can get the unpack function, which will unpack the node structure. And now it's actually paired it to our object also automatically. So if we were to work on this more and move the object around, we would not have to worry about the nodes being left behind. However, any new nodes that you add, like this, for example, will not follow the hierarchy until you once more pack the hierarchy. Now, that is pretty much everything you need to know about the flux tip. I'm going to be going over some community tooling next that'll help you with organizing your flux. But for now, I hope you enjoyed the video. And I would ask that you like it if you liked it. And ideally, give me some suggestions for what to cover next in the comments. I hope you have a nice day. Bye.